ACV 20-0415 James versus the city of Peoria. Each side of 20 minutes to present uh, your uh, uh, argument. Um, and uh, Council, you have you have time for rebuttal, but you'll have to uh, keep track of the time yourself. Okay. That won't be a problem for you. It shouldn't we be. Were, <laughs> we are recording the argument in uh, audio and video. When you turn, please identify yourself in your class so that when we review the audio uh, uh, recording, we, we won't be confused by the speaker. The uh, argument will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. We've read the, the briefs, we've looked at the record, we've conferenced the case, so we're familiar with the facts of the law. So when you begin your argument, just launch right into what you would like for us uh, to know. Counsel, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do the oral argument. Uh, my name is David Apney. May it please the court, and I represent uh, the appellants in this matter. And I know this is an uphill fight. It's an uphill fight because of Drew uh, more than anything else. But uh, if you're going to strictly construe the notice of claim statutes, you really ought to strictly construe then whatever offer is made, whatever is presented in the notice of claim. Uh, in this particular notice of claim, the phrase that got the, uh, the claimants into trouble was uh, this compromise to settle is valid for 30 days from the date of this letter. And if, if, if I were to receive that from another lawyer, I would say, well, okay, it's valid for 30 days. What happens after 30 days? Does it automatically become invalid? And I would just call up to, to verify if I was worried about the length of time at all. Well, what do you mean when you say that shall be valid for 30 days? There's nothing, if you strictly construe that offer, it does not say that it becomes invalid after 30 days or ceases to have any force and effect. So, counsel, than, counsel, if if the statement that it's valid for 30 days uh, does not affect what happens after, if it stands separate and apart and we can't glean anything from it, what's the point of including it? It shouldn't have been in there. It's language that's commonly put into regular old settlement offers that go out to other to uh, to non-public entities. Uh, and that's that's really what happened at this law firm. I talked this over with the council and uh, they say it's just it's just boilerplate language we put into these. And for some reason it got it remained in this. It shouldn't have been in there. We didn't want it to be in there, but it was in there. And uh, that's the explanation of why it's there. It wasn't to, it wasn't to try to restrict the notice of claim process at all. It was a, it was a leftover from another form letter. You know how these letters are copied over and over in different different ways. You you take rote language and put it in there and that's what happened here. Well, there, was, there was never so any intent. It was a mistake to it, so it typically is included as a way to define the terms of the offer, but in this case it was a mistake to include it. Yes, and it's typically included to try to get the other side to move on something. Uh, when you when you do these in the private context to a an insurance company or, or so forth, uh, often they they don't feel a real sense of urgency unless you give them a sense of urgency that this offer is going to be open for thirty days or whatever. Uh, what I what I what I usually do is say this offer will remain open for thirty days and can be extended if that's necessary to to further your investigation. But if you're going to well, straight, the, yes, sure. Cancel. I, I, I understand. It is unfortunate that it was included, but the fact is that it has been included. We have to construe the offer as it's presented, whether it was intended or not, and that's inconsistent with the. The, the the statute. So aren't we? I mean, I understand that we can disagree with Drew if we choose to, but it, it seems. I mean, if we think Drew is correctly decided, that's kind of the end of the story here. Well, if well, there's a couple of things there. If Drew is correctly decided, which I would I would 
quibble quite a bit about that. But uh, if if you're going to strictly construe the statutes, you ought to strictly construe the offers that are made. And if you strictly construe this, it does not say that the offer becomes invalid or is withdrawn or has no force in effect. There's certainly an implication there. I no question about it. But if you're if you're if you're going to be in the land of strictly construing things, then you can't just you can't just operate by implication. You have to look at the language and what does it actually say. Uh, that's where it, Drew is is a very odd decision. I've always wondered about it. It, it talks and the language there was the offer would remain open until December 30, 2011, unless earlier withdrawn. And that's all it said. So it's open until a certain date unless earlier withdrawn. And it doesn't say that it was going to be withdrawn as of the date that was specified or that would lapse at that time. But based on that, in paragraph 13, the Drew opinion said their offer explicitly lapsed. But it didn't explicitly lapse. And in paragraph 18, it talks about the plaintiffs withdrew their settlement offer after no more than 15 days. And they didn't withdraw their settlement offer after no more than 13 days. But Mr. Uh, Abney, by your 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 comment earlier, when when I asked about why would the offer valid for 30 days phrase be included if it was of no effect, if, if it did not speak to what happens after 30 days, why include it in the first place? One of the things you said was <clears throat> we put that in there typically to motivate insurance companies to settle quickly to, you know, they have a tendency to drag their feet. So, I mean, does it, doesn't that support the opposite argument that if, you, if you're saying, look, we're giving you 30 days to make up your mind, that means we're giving you 30 days. We're not giving you any additional time. So something happens at the 30 days by your own argument. Well, right? it's, well in a sense, it's, it's, to, it's, to, it's to give the sense of urgency. This is valid for 30 days. There's an implication that it may be withdrawn after that, may not be, who knows. But at least there is a date in there and the insurance company can look at that and get back with you and say, I can't do anything within 30 days. Uh, do you really mean that this offer is invalid at the end of 30 days or can we have an extension after that? Uh, and that's that's what's all. In fact, every time I've done this w with an insurance company, they always come back and say, we need more time. Uh, are you serious about this 30 days? Is are you is it really going to become invalid after 30 days or not? And so they get back with you. Uh, so, we so is the onus then put on the the governmental entity to clarify? No, and and I mean the case law said over and over that basically the government entity can sit there, big fat, dumb, and happy, and not do anything at all. And I understand that. Uh, but the difficulty is if the government entity, entity is really interested or is puzzled by by anything that's that's in a notice of claim, they can certainly ask. I mean, the onus isn't on them, but why not ask? We've operated under the fiction, the amiable fiction for a long time that the purpose of this notice of claim statute and its limits and whatnot is to give the government time to investigate, evaluate, appraise, decide whether it's going to settle. And that's not what this is all about. These short, short deadlines are designed so that, that notices of claim and claims fail. I mean, you've got 180 days to get your notice of claim in. It's a statute of limitations. If you don't do it within 180 days, or if you don't do it right, correctly within 180 days, you're doomed. Uh, ARS section 12821.01 subpart A it requires you to do certain things. You get the notice of claim in, you give some facts describing why the public entity is liable, you put in a some certain amount, you give some facts explaining why the some certain amount is proper and supportable. And if you don't do those simple things, you know, within 180 days, there's a penalty for that. And it's the last sentence of 12821.01a. It says, any claim that is not filed within 180 days after the cause of action accrues is barred and no action may be maintained thereon. There is nothing like that in subpart E. Subpart E has is is one of the most inscrutable things the legislature has ever written. You know? And what it says, pardon my, I got my blue folder here. Uh, a claim against a public entity or public employee filed pursuant to this section is deemed denied 60 days after the filing of the claim, unless the claimant is advised of the denial in writing before the expiration of 60 days. It does not say 
that if you file this notice of claim and put in any sort of deadline in it, or if you file the notice of claim on day one and sue us on day two, that somehow the notice of claim is invalid or improper. There's nothing like that at all. Uh, my presumption has always been that what it's, what it's sort of designed to do is it sort of gives you a 60-day breathing period and a certainty on your part as a claimant. You, you, you put this claim in and so often all you hear is crickets coming back. Nothing happens. And so 60 days later at that point, you go ahead and file your lawsuit. That's the way I've always looked at it. But it doesn't even say that at all anywhere in there. It doesn't say that you have to wait 60 days before filing your lawsuit. Well, so, I mean, if you read. Oh, go ahead. But if a plaintiff has a particular reason, whatever that reason may be, to make a shorter period, the plaintiff is in charge of their own case. If, if for whatever reason they want an answer within 30 days, they can make that offer. That offer doesn't conform to the statute. But they can make their offer if they chose to, and that wouldn't under the statute that wouldn't be a uh, that wouldn't be a proper notice of of claim, right? Well, un under Drew, it would be improper if if you try to if you tried to say this offer is only open for thirty days and no more. Period. We're done. I'm going to sue you. You know that would not that would not work under Drew. <laughs> but then again. As I mentioned before, I don't think Drew makes any sense. As a claimant, it's impossible for me to change that 60-day deadline in subsection E. I can't do it. I can't extend it. I can't shorten it. There is nothing I can say. I can jump up and down to my, and hold my breath until I turn blue. I can't affect this, this, that, that period in, in subsection E. I can't do anything about it. And Drew seems to operate under the idea, well, you can. No, you can't. If you file your notice of claim within the 180 day period and it's it's got the you know all the facts that it needs, the some certain demand, if it's, everything is proper, if you file it within 100 days, you are done. You have done all that you need to do to file a proper notice of claim. The notion that somehow I could extend the period of time for the government to consider it or shorten it makes no sense at all. I can't do that. And of course, the statute, as, as we mentioned in the briefing, is incorporated into the offer. It's whether you like it or not, it's built into it's built into that offer because it's part of the part of state law and it's, it becomes state law. State statutes are part of all are parts of contracts. There's nothing there's nothing a claimant can do to shorten that time. Nothing a claimant can do to extend it. And I submit to you that if, if Drew is the decision point here, Drew was wrongly decided. And I would ask the court to do what it hates to do. But to take a take a close look at Drew and see if it really makes any sense. Um, those are the basics of my argument, Your Honors. If I may uh, re reserve my time. Sure they uh, cancel. All right, thank you. <laughs> may it please the court. My name is Amanda Sheridan, and I represent the appellee, the city of Peoria. I'd first like to touch on um, the point about that Judge Cruz made about um, how the word um, valid would typically define the terms of the offer. So I'd like to provide an example first. If I got a coupon in the mail and it said this sales price on this blender is valid through December 31st, I would understand that if I went in on January 5th, and presented this coupon and said, hey, I'd like to get this blender at this price. They're not going to sell it to me at that price because the offer was only valid through December 31st. That's why this whole discussion is very disingenuous in terms of whether the opposite of valid is invalid. It is commonly understood that when you say something is valid for 30 days, that after that 30 day period, it becomes invalid. And when we look at the Drew case, plaintiff admitted herself that when she looked at the Drew case, she understood that when they said the offer was open until December 30th, 2011, that that meant that after that period of time, the offer was then closed. Now, why does this matter? Why does the 60 days matter at all? The reason is, is that the governmental entity has to be able to come back at any point within that 60 day period to accept the offer. 
And if the offer is only open for 30 days, then what happens on day 31 if the city tries to accept the offer? Um, council would have you believe this is completely meaningless phrase. It has no effect on the city, but the city understood that the offer was only open for 30 days. Now, if we had come tr and tried to accept that offer on day 31, yes, it's possible that they would have honored it and, and let the city accept. However, if they hadn't, if they had said, nope, we said only 30 days, and we had come back and said, well, the statute allows us 60 days, um, then it, the onus would have then been on the city to try to go and enforce that contract. The city would have then had to sue the plaintiff uh, to try to get the court to enforce the offer and the acceptance of the offer that the city had made. Ms. James doesn't deny that she was required to comply with the notice of claim statute. The statute requires that she serve on the city a statutorily compliant offer. The courts have interpreted that to mean that it has to be timely, it needs facts to support liability, it needs a some certain settlement amount, it needs facts supporting the settlement amount, and it needs to be held open for 60 days. If it's not held open for 60 days, then what is the point of requiring a some certain settlement amount? The point of it is so that the city can then come back and accept that some certain amount. If plaintiff was allowed to just withdraw offers and make new ones during that entire 60 day period, then there would be no point in the some certain settlement requirement. But, but, but cancel, we, we really don't have any issue with the other elements. Do we, the, the only issue that that we're grappling with is the time that the, that the offer was left open, correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's true. However, if you want to read the entire statute together, um, which is obviously the goal of statutory construction, then there would be no value to requiring a some certain settlement offer if the claimant can just turn around and withdraw it the next day. Um, at various points in her briefing, plaintiff argued on the one hand, that the offer is not required to be held open for 60 days. But then on the other hand, that the city would be able to accept that offer at any point within the 60 days. And those are two completely contradictory um, themes there. I mean, if the offers can be withdrawn and then a new offer made within the 60 day period, then how is that a some certain settlement offer? The city would be left constantly um, potentially having new offers made and being unclear as to which one was the operative offer. And if the statute requires the first offer to be open 60 days, then can they still go back and accept that offer? It, it's very confusing unless it's made clear that the offer itself is open for 60 days. Well, Cancel, as I understand the situation, the... I, at least w within the 30 days, the, the, there is an offer of a some certain. And the, the, the only issue is whether the statute supersedes the language of the offer that is valid only for uh, uh, 30 days. Is it reasonable to uh, based on the statute to say that any time that you file a notice of, of claim, for, uh, that the offer is open for 60 days unless the party w offers a longer period of time. By the operation of the statute, all, all offers made to a governmental entity are open for 60 days. Your Honor, I do think it's reasonable to assume that um, because the statute controls that the city should be able to accept the offer for 60 days. However, that brings me back to my point about how then the onus is on the city. If that's not the understanding that the claimant had, the onus then becomes on the city to try to enforce that contract. And that just can't be what the legislature intended, that every time that this example happened, a city would have to go sue to enforce the contract that was formed by the offer and the notice of claim and our acceptance of it. Well, but Kim, I, I don't understand why that's 
a terrible onus on the state, on a governmental entity because if the offer isn't kept open, open for 60 days, then it's not a valid notice of claim. Right. And, and exactly, Your Honor. So, it, and that's exactly why in this case it wasn't a valid notice of claim because it did only hold the offer open for 30 days. Um, and and it, it is clear under the statute that the city is supposed to get that 60 days to investigate, to think over the offer, to budget, to do financial planning, and then to decide whether or not to accept that offer or not. Um, but but, when, but, my, but my, my point was if the city contacts the plaintiff on day 31 says, we will accept your offer. If the plaintiff says, nope, I left it open only for 30 days, you're right. Then your answer is, well, that's unfortunate because then there is no valid notice of claim and you lose. So how does, how does the city lose under and that scenario. I think in in we still have to go back to whether we are requiring strict statutory compliance. Um, the case law has made clear, including the uh, Deer Valley Unified School District versus Hauser, the Arizona Supreme Court case, that strict compliance with the statute is required. And the court mentioned that it didn't think compliance with the statute was that difficult. And <clears throat> one of the ways that you comply is by making it clear that you are complying with the statute and leaving your offer open for 60 days. Um, and so effectively, if we were to say in this case that, well, it doesn't matter that they only put in that it was valid for 30 days, it didn't hurt the city. Um, it's, it's effectively to also taking away one of our defenses, uh, which is that then the notice of claim is invalid. Um, if it, if in this particular case we found that it didn't matter that they included the phrase valid for only 30 days, um, then it's taking away one of the city's defenses to whether the notice of claim was valid. Well, but if you want to accept the offer, if it's on day 31, how you wouldn't need to raise that defense because you want to accept the offer. So I, I, I don't... I, I, think in this, I think in this case, Your Honor, the point is that the city of Peoria did not believe that it could have accepted the offer on day 31. So regardless of whether we actually could have come in and accept the offer, we believed that the offer had expired after 30 days. What about Mr. Abney's statement that, uh, that the city could have contacted them and or it contacted the plaintiff and said, hey, uh, there's there's a problem with this, it's uh, it's too short. Did, did anything like that ever happen to your knowledge? No, Your Honor, in this case, that did not happen. However, I think that goes back to the idea that the onus does not have to be on the city to make sure that plaintiff has submitted a proper notice of claim. The city actually gets, you know, hundreds or thousands of notices of claim um, over, you know, period of time and it the onus cannot be on the city to go back to every single one of those claimants and say hey your notice of claim was defective you need to figure out how to do it properly and then resubmit it um it, it's just and that's why the case law has really focused on the idea that it is the responsibility of the claimant to make a proper notice of claim okay so counsel what it if i if i run with that and say okay the onus is on them to fulfill requirements but then the argument that the the 60 day requirement is not a statutory requirement that's that's obviously contrary to drew but such as it is that's mr abney's argument so uh, can you walk us through why why we should say that this is a requirement he he read subsection e and subsection e does not have the the language in there that says this is if you don't do this within this date then it's not so can you explain that? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so what what I would go back to would be first the Deer Valley Unified case that the Arizona Supreme Court decided. And in it, they talked about the fact that every word, phrase, clause, and sentence of a statute must be given meaning so that no part will be void, inert, redundant, or trivial. 
Now, the 60 day requirement in subsection E, where it says that the public entity uh, gets 60 days to deny the claim after it receives it, would then be redundant or trivial if the offer doesn't also have to be held open for 60 days. Because there would be no purpose of having a 60 day requirement if the offer doesn't also have to be held open for that 60 days. And so the you're statute saying that subsection A's requirement section, it's it, in essence, it's penalty provision has to be read into E. Is is that what you're saying? Yes, Your Honor. I, I would argue that the entire 12821.01, the entirety of the statute needs to be read together and understood together for statutory construction purposes. And that's really what the court in Drew found. They found that the uh, subsection E would be meaningless if the offer itself didn't also have to be held open for that 60 days. Um, and the court's opinion delivered by Judge Winthrop found that it did not comply because it explicitly lapsed after that 15 day period. And here, when you say something's valid for 30 days, I think we've kind of established that it means it's invalid after that 30 days, which means that it effectively was, the offer was lapsed or withdrawn at that point. Um, but Ms. Sheridan, couldn't section E fairly be read to um, putting it drew aside for just a moment? Couldn't we say that section E is simply notice to potential claimants that after 60 days, take action because we've deemed it denied, whether it be because we've done our planning, uh, because we've done our budget and we've decided we cannot or will not accept this offer for whatever reason, uh, do what you need to do. 60 days have passed and crickets from us means we are not accepting. So couldn't it also fairly be read that way? It's notice to the claimant. It's not necessarily um, a, a statutory period given to the, author to the governmental authority. I would agree with you that it is not entirely clear, which is why I think the court has had to uh, have several cases where they've construed 12821.01. Um, and because the court does always try to construe all parts of the statute as, as working together and giving it all meaning, you know, ultimately that's what the court has found is that in order to effectuate meaning for subsection A, then you have to construe subsection E as requiring that 60 days for the offer to be held open. Because uh, again, what is the effectiveness of a 60 day denial if on day 12, you know, plaintiff could say, claimant could say, oh, well, I've withdrawn that offer now. So even though I was required to give you this some certain settlement offer, and even though I was required to ho hold it open for, you know, 60 days, um, you know, and include these facts and da, 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 I'm just going to withdraw it and you don't actually have those 60 days. Counsel, but I mean, what about Mr. Abney's argument that that is a nullity? that that if if you were to say hey uh i i'm withdrawing this in 15 after 15 days has elapsed and, and he says well the the city gets to come back and say well that's tough the statute says it's open for 60 days so what about that argument i i would i would agree to some degree that there isn't anything a claimant can do to enlarge or shorten the time period however be, if they purport to do that, then again, it, the onus is then on the city to try to accept that offer and to try to get it enforced. Um, whereas well, but, if they had remained silent, so the other claimant, the other statutory beneficiary in this case, Dennis McGinnis, his attorney, through his attorney, he submitted a notice of claim and it was completely silent as to how long the some certain settlement offer was open. So well, well, that would be a proper... Yes, but Council, I, I don't understand your own argument because if you want the offer, if you want to accept your offer, and if it was if the if it was a normal <laughs> notice of claim, and if you went to accept it within the sixty days, that's something got an onus. That's you trying to accept the offer. If they've instituted some odd shorter uh, time period, you still gonna go to them and say, we want the offer. If they turn it down, then 
then they lose because then it's not a valid uh, 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 notice of claim. So I don't understand your own argument about we, we have to sue to to enforce the contact. No, no, you don't. You either accept, either accept the uh, the offer that or the city accepts the offer that was made, or if the plaintiff doesn't want to do that, then they lose because it's not a valid notice of claim. I guess my point to the, my response to that, Your Honor, would be that no matter what, it's going to require litigation at that point to um, figure out whether there was a valid notice of claim or whether there was um, a binding contract formed. So there is going to be further litigation no matter what if the plaintiff, if the claimant, if I come back and say on day 31, hey, I'd like to accept this offer, and they say no, uh, then there's either going to be a lawsuit on on the city's part to try to enforce the terms of the contract, if that's what the city wants, or there's going to be litigation uh, where the city then has to argue that there was no valid notice of claim. So Thank that's you. really the onus I'm talking about. Thank you. Um, Your Honors, if there are no other questions, our point would just be that Ms. James failed to make a statutorily compliant offer, uh, that the Drew case was certainly binding on uh, the Superior Court, although I recognize that this court can choose to overturn it. I do not believe that it should. Um, Ms. James's notice of claim was defective, and we ask this court to uphold the lower court's ruling. Thank you. Ms. Sheridan, before you step down, I have one last question, and that is, is there a distinction between uh, just a regular old vanilla settlement offer and a notice of claim? Are those distinct mechanisms? Yes, Your Honor. I, I would definitely think that those are distinct mechanisms. Um, as you know, the legislature did shorten um, the time periods. You know, there's only a, a one year period for the claimant to actually file a lawsuit. Um, there's the statute giving us, you know, the requiring them to file the notice of claim itself. That's not just a, a settlement offer. Um, if it were, then it wouldn't have or need all of these, uh, the statute or all of this, um, you know, court interpretation of the statute to um, to effectuate it. So. so is it possible to make a settlement offer that is a settlement offer and is non-compliant with the, the notice of claim statute, but is still a valid settlement offer? Yes, I could see that scenario happening. I mean, I definitely think that occasionally happens in terms of after the notice of claim period has expired. So, for instance, um, if someone does a valid notice of claim and we've you know considered it, but more than the 60 days had passed, then we can always go back and say at that point, yes, uh, we might be interested, but we need a new um, offer at this point or something like that. So, yes, I could see that you even in the context of suing a public entity, you could make a settlement offer. That also happens during litigation, obviously, um, after a case has been filed. Um, sometimes settlements happen at that point. Um, and, but, but that's why we do that have the notice of claim. Notice of claim, right? I'm sorry? Your point is that that wouldn't then be a notice of claim, though, right? Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. I have no further thank questions. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Council. Mr. Abney, you, you have you have some time for rebuttal. Okay, I'll I'll do what I can productively with that time. Uh, uh, the word disingenuous was used concerning our arguments, and I hate that because I always have to look it up. Uh, and it means lacking in candor, giving a false appearance of simple frankness, or calculating. I'm not lacking in candor. I am not giving a false appearance to simply a simple frankness. I am being frank. I'm certainly not calculating. I wish I knew how to do that, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, we're just trying to figure out what to do about this oddball statute in this strange situation. Uh, I was looking at the statute again. I've been looking at it for days on end. And uh, when you get right down to it, my, my, my colleague across the aisle says there's no purpose for having a 60 day requirement. Unless it means that if if you do something like put a time limit in your notice of claim that it, that it invalidate the whole thing. But I think the purpose of sub of subsection E is really to confer a benefit on the claimant. 
that you can put in your notice of claim, you get it in a timely filed, and then you don't have to wait around until you're at the one year mark and have to file your lawsuit, that you can, you can wait 60 days if you don't hear anything, which you usually don't, then you're free at that time to go ahead uh, it's been denied. It's deemed denied. You don't have to worry about whether they're going to accept it or not. You just go ahead and file your lawsuit. Uh, I it, it so really, I think it's, it's supposed to be a protection for the claimant or an aid to the claimant in trying to figure out when the proper time to sue is. So and there was some people, if I might, uh, you agree with me that that our Supreme Court has stated that the purpose of the statute is to allow. Uh, whether you agree with it or not, the, the stated purpose of the statute is allow is to allow public entities uh, to be able to plan, to be able to evaluate, to be able to investigate, to be able to budget that this is all from Hauser, right? So uh, doesn't that equally apply to a, a period of time, a breathing space as, as you had had it in order to, to look at that particular offer? What do you do with that? Well, superficially, yes. And I know that's the language that's been used for decades in cases describing the notice of claim process. It's not really accurate. Uh, if the legislature had really wanted to provide time for reflection, evaluation, investigation, and all that, they would have extended all the deadlines. And they didn't. They shortened everything. And you've really got uh, one quarter of the usual two years for, you know, you got wrongful death, personal injury claim. Let's assume that's the kind of claim we're talking about. You normally have two years after the claim accrues. Here you got 180 days, less than one fourth of the time. Everything's compacted down. It's really designed to make sure that claims fail more than anything else. But even if we even if we take, like I said at the beginning, the amiable fiction that it's to allow this time to investigate and whatnot, once you get the claim in within 180 days, you've done your job, you've passed the hurdle, the last sentence of subpart A, and you can look at subpart B and say, okay, uh, they've got 60 days to look at that. It'll be deemed denied at the end of 60 days. I won't have to worry about uh, waiting around forever and ever. I can go ahead and file the lawsuit at that time, but that's what we're going to do. Now, I heard a lot of talk about withdrawing your offer. Uh, if you're a plaintiff's lawyer and you file this notice of claim, you got it in within 180 days, uh, and the 180 day, let's say you get it filed on day 179, all these things tend to go to the wire, as you know. Uh, the last thing on earth you're going to do is withdraw anything because somebody's going to come back and say, well, you know, you withdraw your notice of claim, 180 days has passed, you're doomed, you're done. Uh, and that's so. I mean, that sort of argument doesn't make much sense. Uh, Counsel, what if what if Miss Sheridan said that that settlement offers can be independent from and distinct mechanisms from notices of claim? What it, you 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 mentioned that this is carried over from another another form, so it must be frequently used in in other contexts. Sure. So d does not your client have the right to put shorter fuses on a settlement offer, which is a legitimate settlement offer, but at the same time doesn't comply with the notice of claim statute. Can she? No. Not? Well, I like to give one word answers to questions like that. I'm not quite sure what the word would be. I think no with an explanation and the explanation would be uh, you can you can engage in all kinds of settlement discussions with a public entity before you before your 180 day deadline and people commonly do in very serious cases where there's obvious liability to contact the city talk to the city's adjuster uh, and say look the liability is obvious uh, would you be willing to talk about settlement without us filing a notice of claim just for the next month or two let's talk about it i'll give you all the records we'll, we'll work this out and that commonly happens but you have to comply with this 180 day deadline or you're doomed. That last sentence in subsection A kills you dead. You're done. Well, who has uh, the responsibility of that compliance? Pardon me, Your Honor? Who has the responsibility of that compliance? The responsibility for getting a valid notice of claim in is, in on, is on the claimant. And if you, if you fulfill all the requirements of subsection A, you've got your valid notice of claim in. You know, the facts, the liability, some certain demand, all that stuff. You get it in, boom, you're done in 180 days. 
you, you, you don't need to put in a, to say that this claim is going to be open for a certain amount of time. And this, it happened in this case purely by accident. Uh, but even if, you, even if you did it intentionally, you can't change the 60-day period in subsection E. However you look at it, what its significance, whether it's, whether it's supposed to aid the claimant or whether it's supposed to trip up the claimant, you cannot change that 60-day period. You know, you you so if, if you wanted a shorter uh, time period and you were serious that 30 days is all it is, if the city comes to you and they say they want and says, we want to accept your offer, are you either going to bound to accept it or can you say, nope, I said 30 days and 30 days was it? I, well, depends how you interpret subparty. If you interpret it as some sort of uh, guaranteed ironclad period of time that you can't sue within, then then there's nothing you can do about it. If you, if you look at it as a protection for the claimant to say that after this period of time, then you may sue, I, I assume you might be able to do what you've suggested, that that, it, that, that, that would be it. The offer would be, you know, that they're, they're not going to take the offer from the city. And I don't and, know. And, I don't, and, and would that mean that there'd be no valid notice of claim? No. The notice of claim is valid no matter, as long as you get it in with all the requirements by the 180-day mark, uh, then you're safe. Now, a lot of people get these in at the 120-day mark or, or much earlier, 90 days or so, just to protect themselves. And during that period of time, you, know, uh, you could you could technically, I suppose, withdraw your notice of claim entirely and then resubmit it as long as you do that within the 180-day de de day deadline. But once you hit that 180 days and you've got your notice of claim in, uh, you would be you'd be committing malpractice to withdraw that notice of claim at that point and try to submit a new one. It just won't work. I mean, I've tried. You know, people have, have messed up notices of claim. I've tried filing uh, an amended notice of claim that would relate back. And that theory got shot down by every court that ever heard it with a lot of laughter in the background. Uh, you, there's, you're, you're pretty much stuck at 180 days with what you've submitted. And as long as you've complied with all the requirements of subpart A, you're safe because we know what happens if you don't comply. If you don't comply, your claim's barred and, you, and no action may, may, may be taken on that. But subpart E is not part of subpart A. Thank you, counsel. We appreciate your argument today uh, and we we uh, no, we appreciate them we'll take this matter under advisement and we'll issue a decision in the course we stand in recess thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you